Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on yes. where you're coming in from. Marsha, Shyam, Giri. Oh, hi, Tracy. Welcome, hey, welcome. Hi, everybody. Hey, Hello. everyone. I feel like the last panel really teed us up for mm. where we're going with our conversation. Yes. Really cool. All right. Serenity, you have the polls and everything. Oh yeah, I'm ready awesome. to go. Yay. <laughs> and I think I have you guys all pinned. Does that look right? There's six of you, yes, yes. Looks good to me. That's all right, great. and we're at 920. So I'll just quickly pass it off to Serenity and Taina who they graduated um, this past year and they were the cohort above me. And so excited for this conversation. If you guys don't know, we recently launched a podcast and they are our wonderful co-hosts. And take it away, guys. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Graduate Yoga Studies podcast panel and live recording. My name is Serenity Tedesco from Cohort 7, and I'll be co-leading this panel with my friend and cohort colleague, Taina rodriguez Berardi. Today, we'll be reflecting upon the past, present, and future of yoga, yoga as an industry, and social justice and racial equity movements in the West. As you all know, the theme of today, today's Yoga Day is diversity in our unity. All of us as individuals make the whole that is the yoga community. So we're curious, in the chat, how would you identify yourself within this yoga space? Would you consider yourself to be a student? teacher, scholar, practitioner, devotee, however you identify, I would like for you to all take a second to write that in the chat so that we can understand the audience to which we're speaking with. And then I'll go ahead and pass it along to Taina. Thank you for calling us into the space, Serenity. And um, while everyone is chatting away, um, we wanted to give a little bit of background as to why we wanted to do this panel. Um, obviously we have the LMU Graduate Yoga Studies podcast that we just launched season one. Um, I believe we're up to our third or fourth episode this week. Um, you can check out uh, Dr. Ranganathan's um, interview on the podcast and many more to come. But we really wanted to think about yoga as we look forward from many different perspectives. And like I mentioned earlier, that the previous panel was amazing. It was about yoga and social change and, and some academics from the, the critical yoga space or, or just the yoga field really discussing um, where we are in this space with um, so many different variables and, and a globalized yoga practice. Um, in this panel, in this podcast live recording, if you will, we really wanted to discuss where we go from here. Um, and we're unique in this conversation in that we have several academics, we have several practitioners, we have people that own an entrepreneur in the yoga space. Um, we have, you know, physical yoga uh, representation, we have online yoga representation, we have, um, you know, people that are devotees to, to certain aspects of, of, of bhakti or, or yoga lineage. And so we wanted to really look at this panel or this recording as an opportunity to see how things have changed, especially over the past year and a half of COVID and acute social unrest from a very much Western and global perspective. Um, so as practitioners, as teachers, as scholars in this post-pandemic, post-socially awakened world, quote unquote, if you will, I'd love to go around um, the virtual room, starting with Marsha, and we'll le let each panelist introduce themselves for about a minute and then maybe start from that place of your location in this conversation of yoga and global experience and where we go, how things have changed or remain the same in the past year and a half or so. <laughs> Marsha, I'd love to start with you. 
Well, thank you so much for having me today. My name is Marcia Banks Harold. I'm an executive engineering leader, and also I'm the director of the Pies Fitness Holistic Yoga Therapy Training Program. I'm also the owner of Pies Fitness Yoga Studio in Alexandria, Virginia. And this is a great question because definitely it has been an opportunity to pivot based on events such as the George Floyd incident, based on the events of trauma that's being experienced in the workplace, in the yoga community, and also in the yoga therapy community. So really my take on this last year and a half has been one of opportunity one to learn how to tap into the philosophy that's been given to us to really be able to thrive in the midst of the present moment, even when there's challenges. And so my experience has been really pivoting from day one creating an online platform, meeting my clients where they are, taking them food when they were in need, really showing up for people when they needed someone just to hold space for them. So that's really been my position. It's an opportunity to really expand the off the mat experience of yoga, to sit with people, to meditate with people, to offer the asana meditation, but more importantly, to build community and to strengthen that. So thank you for having me. That's my first response. Thanks. Thank you for your uh, response, Marsha. And I'd like to direct this question also to Shiam. I believe you're on mute. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, can you repeat the question? Absolutely. How have things changed or remained the same in the past year for yoga practitioners and beyond? Okay, so I'm going to start with introducing myself. I'm Sean Ranganathan. Uh, I am a member of the Department of Philosophy in York Center for Asian Research at, uh, at York University in Toronto. Uh, I am a philosopher, a translation theorist, and a scholar of yoga, and uh, I started yoga philosophy uh, uh, in 2019, yogaphilosophy.com as a scholar practitioner platform to uh, provide education on both yoga and philosophy to people who are interested. And uh, the reason I started it is I was, well, I wasn't entirely sure if anybody would be interested, but I was just kind of extremely tired of the quackery that goes on in the yoga world where, you know, people, they learn a little bit, nothing really his not based on the history or the tradition, they feign being South Asian in some way by dress, or, or and then and then they just package uh, something completely Eurocentric. So they 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 the contort they'll treat yoga as just contortionism, <laughs> and then they'll add some kind of Western philosophy, Aristotelian naturalism, or a million liberal liberalism, and call it uh, yoga. And so I, I, I was just kind of, but that's like, that's like huge. It's not like a small thing. It's, it's a huge thing. It's just uh, kind of so pervasive. So that's why I started that. And for me, I guess the pandemic has really made clear the distinction between, um, well, two things. First of all, the people who are actually interested in learning about yoga and people who are interested in participating in this exercise of Western imperialism and white supremacy, where they repackage Western things and call it yoga, but also how this correlates with strategies for coping with the pandemic response to science-based uh, uh, advice with respect to vaccines and masking and stuff like that, right? And so there's this remarkable correlation with, the, with this kind of activity of white supremacy, calling it yoga and being anti-science, anti-vaccine, et cetera and this, this narcissistic endeavor, and then people who are interested in learning um, on the other side. So for me, that's become much clearer uh, as a function of this current crisis. Thank you. I think you bring up a lot of, um, you know, aspects of, of, of the past year and a half that we're now even just seeing come more and more to the forefront as we move forward into the future. 
And I think that brings me to, um, to ask Gidi the same um, question, if you could introduce yourself and also think about or, or, or give us a, a moment on how things have changed or, or remain the same in the past year for you from your perspective um, um, in this place of yoga. Hello everyone, my name is Gidi Bai. Um, a little background on myself, I uh, am a cohort seven member of the Yoga Studies program. So. Uh, these are my fellow cohort members. Um, I, my religious background is through Kali Mandir in Laguna Beach. So I took Diksha initiation maybe three years ago into a Hindu lineage, loosely asso associated with the Juna Akada um, through a small mandir in um, uh, Praya Graj called Yoga Vedanta Kutir. Um, so I have some background in teaching yoga asana as well in the yoga studio setting. Um, through Radha Yoga in Mid-City, uh, which was a very diverse yoga studio. Uh, currently, I'm not teaching, and I think that reflects a lot of what's going on with uh, the changes in the yoga studio world and yoga studio culture. I think one of the big ones, obviously, is through the coronavirus pandemic. You see um, a movement of yoga asana studios towards um, digital content, which has been extremely challenging for me to connect in that way with other uh, yoga students um, coming from the platform of teaching in a personalized manner or um, really kind of wanting to give that individual the best sort of setting for their asana practice. It, it, I had found it very challenging to do so uh, through the internet. One, because of, you know, looking at their alignment or their posture, which is also a very Western perspective through the camera was not 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 too effective in my um, teaching style. So I, I, I struggled with teaching in that way. And then of course, I think the second most major and pivotal event of, of last year was the killing of George Floyd. And you saw a, a massive social justice movement, which you know took me out onto the streets <laughs> um, for, for a large portion of the year. So much of the practice of last year was off the mat and off the cushion um and outside in a way that didn't didn't necessarily feel like the yoga of before which was very um the good vibes only tribe or a love and light crew um this changed dramatically because yoga had become about more like that scene from bhagavad gita where arjun feels the fear of going into battle and having to you know kill entire sections of his family and krishna says that he has to go and do it um I remember, you know, sitting in front of lines of police and doing my japa and uh, chanting on my mala just in a similar way. So I think yoga was moved from a very <laughs> cushion centric, uh, mat centric yoga studio, um, sort of neoliberal yoga studio world out into the streets and exposed to all sorts of like leftist ideologies and paradigms. Um, and unfortunately, I think the way neoliberal regimes often respond to uh, issues of race and gender is through performative identity politics. So you see a lot of that being implemented in yoga studios today, identity politics in a very performative way. So I'm hoping that can shift into identity politics that are actually meaningful to the individual. It's not that identity politics are wrong, it's just the way they're being deployed in a performative fashion. I want all individuals to use their identity to empower themselves, particularly in a yoga practice where you're, you're seeking the internal self. And maybe through some analysis that requires us to look at Tantra, we can integrate the body into our sort of spiritual practice um, that doesn't negate the body fully. Um, so we can kind of look at how our identity um, coerces with the physical body and through our yoga asana practice, we can integrate those two, the, the sort of more spiritual self or, or mental self with the physical self in a lot of ways. But I think unfortunately to problematize it a little bit before we go into any solutioning space, you do see sort of like not much of a change in the hierarchical yoga studio model where you have essentially a, a yoga studio owner or a yoga teacher that is like a CEO and guru at the same time, which leads to a very um, uh, hierarchical relationship between the main yoga teacher, this so-called master teacher in this yoga asana tradition, and the students that are sort of like 
subservient, even, even so much so that they're doing work studies that don't have pay, you know? So it's like this exploitation of labor from a Marxist perspective, very clearly on display. Um, so hopefully we can look at some ways to solve those sort of like performative identity politics and those issues around, you know, you seem to have some issues around class, gender, and race in the yoga studio model currently that aren't, or that are sort of being solved in very performative ways right now, in my opinion, at least. Thank you, Giddy. I really appreciate what you're sharing and you're bringing up a lot of really subtle points that I hope that we can discuss more in the future. I do think it's really interesting that the Love and Light crew has re-identified themselves to be more of a, a social activist, fierce um, group of people that are engaging with society and with capitalism. I'd like to direct the question to Tracy. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Tracy T. Meyer. I'm an associate professor of theological studies at LMU. So I work in theological studies. I'm a comparative theologian. And I also teach in the yoga studies program here, as well as women's and gender studies. And I'm the director of the peace and justice studies program at LMU. And uh, Giri really touched on a big piece of what I wanted to say at the outset, which is that um, we're not in a post COVID post socially awakened world. And in many ways, everything has changed or it seems like everything has changed, but in reality, nothing has changed at all. And um, this was really heightened for me. I really saw this uh, when LMU went back in, to classes in person. And I've been talking with my students and um, thinking that, oh, we're finally in person. We're going to be able to connect in real life. This is how um, yogic philosophy and my theological principles come into play where we're humans interacting with humans on a shared journey towards individual and social liberation, yay, yay, yay. And my white students are all on board. And then I talk with my students of color, my genderqueer students, my non-binary students and my trans students, and they're terrified to be back in person. For them, the chance to learn online made them realize how much of their life is ter low-grade terror, like constant, um, a constant experience of being in a space that is not for them. And constantly reminded that private spaces and public spaces are constructed to be white, heteronormative, cisgender spaces. And so coming back in person for them, was has actually been very traumatic. And it made me realize that um, my whole orientation towards our, our world online may be actually problematic, but I haven't seized the opportunity to learn from the yogic connection that can happen online and then to take that learning into the world and to really challenge spaces that we would like to think are inclusive spaces, but in fact are not at all. So I think I'll stop there so we can start a broader conversation, but I think uh, everybody has really hit on some really key points. Thank you, Dr. T. Meyer, for your response. I think all of us really have a unique perspective in, uh, in, in analyzing and observing the changes that have taken in the past year or the non-changes that have happened, as you aptly pointed out. Change is happening, but for whom is it happening for? Um, I think that is the big question. And speaking of questions, we do have a poll for all of you to participate in. And it's very much related to the points that our panelists have made throughout this first response. If all of you can answer these questions on your own, I would be, we would use these answers as a part of our reflections in the panel. Um, very quickly, I'll just read a little bit. For more than a year, our global society has experienced the coronavirus pandemic and etc. Do you believe the yoga industry has been genuine or performative in its efforts? Second question, do you think that the yoga industry acknowledged the context of our times? Does it really? And lastly, does the yoga industry serve our needs within this context as Marsha pointed? Are we pivoting or are we doing the same things? If you can take just a moment or two to answer this question, we'll proceed with our next question in the meantime. Um, as much of what 
the panelists have discussed have been about social change, social justice, and in, even the inclusion of capitalism and what that if how that affects the yoga industry and the yoga studio spaces. Um, and within this kind of discourse, there's been a call for many different changes or possibilities to move forward. Uh, one has been to completely reimagine the system and destruct it all, start from a completely new place. Others believe that there's a room for fixing, we can modify, we can pivot. And then others say that there's absolutely nothing wrong going on. What, how, what does social justice and how does social justice and capitalism coexist in modern yoga industry? Can they effectively coexist in the modern yoga industry? I'm curious about your thoughts, Giddy, especially with your last comments. Yeah, well, so I think I would back up a little bit and say, I think essentially there was a critique of capitalism by Marx that like the internal inconsistencies in, in, in capitalism would lead to its decline. That didn't happen. So Marx's predictions about revolutions sweeping through Europe didn't actually occur. So we think about well, what did capitalism do to save itself? Well, you, you look at it and, and it globalized. So it pushed sort of the exploitation, the domination and the alienation of the worker onto the, the global South. So we're, we're moving it from domestically pressing workers locally, which is still happening, but pushing it over to other countries. So you have sort of this one way of capitalism saving itself. And then another way it does that, it, it saves itself from rich issues of race and gender through these performative identity politics that we talked about. Um, and if you talk to sort of like leftists on the street engaged in social justice activism, most of them are taking sort of Marxist critiques, anti-capitalism, anti-fascist perspectives um, on this whole thing. So if, in that perspective from the, the social justice activist, solutions to capitalism that are within capitalism don't, aren't, aren't the answer. Um, granted, I will say no one is opposed to people teaching yoga and um, engaging uh, in labor, like being a yoga teacher as their sort of employment. I think what needs to change in my perspective is the yoga studio model. So right now you have hierarchy you have these work study things where I've seen, you know, this sort of abusive model where people are, are working for the main yoga teacher with no pay. So this is kind of like the definition of the exploitation of labor. I think you see alienation and what the yoga teacher has to teach and the disconnection that they have from the final sort of like spiritual aspiration of the practice that they're teaching. They're, they're having to teach only vinyasa flow because this is profitable to the yoga studio. So in the Marxist critique, it's the person who makes the pin is disconnected from the watch. So it, it, in, a, in, a, in a lot of ways, the yoga teacher is disconnected from the, the goal of yoga or perhaps the Ashtanga yoga, the Patanjali Yoga Shastra and the eight limbs. They're kind of focusing on the one little limb, the asana, just like the pin maker who who is disconnected from the watch, the yoga teacher is disconnected from the Ashtanga system because they're just having to focus on asana. And then a very particularly small part of asana, vinyasa flow. Um, so I think there's there's those sort of critiques of capitalism operating in the, in the capitalistic yoga studio model that we can look at. And perhaps solutions to that are looking at different models. We're not gonna overthrow capitalism right now. <laughs> um, but we do have yoga studios and, and students that need to learn yoga and these are yoga and getting into the body is very helpful for the traumas that everyone is experiencing in the world right now um, and finding those traumas inside the body. So in my, in my opinion, if we look at yoga teacher co-op owned models, sort of socializing or democratizing the yoga studio uh, ownership model, um, both financially and in terms of leadership in the yoga studio, you can look at a more socialized, democratized um, setting in a yoga studio that that doesn't just performatively apply identity, deploy identity politics, but actually implements these these identities in a, in a meaningful way and in an intersectional sort of leadership style. Um, so I think 
I think there has to be some change uh, to the industry as we know it to sort of align with more of a, a new politic that's emerging. Thank you, Gidi. I think you big, uh, bring up a, a big um, challenge to our current times in that our Western specifically gaze is very much focused on the um, the studio model and um, and you know that functioning as our de facto representation of what yoga is today and you know which is interesting because in our panel uh, or I'm sorry in our poll uh, 73 percent of people who answered in our poll about two minutes ago um, felt that the yoga industry has been performative in its um, involvings or or reflection upon or reactions to coronavirus pandemic, but also the racism and police brutality that um, you know many of our brothers, sisters, and siblings are all protesting against because it reflects such a larger um, piece of the uh, Western colonial American culture. Um, so, Marsha, I want to come to you and ask, especially because Giddy brings up this, the studio and this model, and I also you are a leader in yoga therapy, and that brings into, for me, the Western model of medicine and healthcare. So I'd love your perspective on how, you know, social justice or social change and capitalism can exist together? Can they coexist or is that just a non-starter? Um, I would love your perspective. Sure, well, thank you. That's that's a really a great question. Um, as a studio owner um, and as a part of these marginalized communities, being a black woman, I've always modeled my yoga studio ownership based on an inclusive environment. So that means that people from special needs communities, the aging population, um, people based on gender choice or sexual preferences, it's it's always been a brave space since I opened in 2010. So I, I understand why the model um, that we're talking about seems a little bit not really purposeful because it is the majority of the model, but there's several businesses like my own where we represent the totality of what yoga really is and that's community. And so my, my real thought process here as a yoga therapist and as a trauma sensitive yoga facilitator is this, if we create authentic, authentic spaces, authentic people will show up with their trauma and they'll feel that it's not performative, it's real, it's welcoming, it's inviting, it's inclusive. And so the answer is that I would propose this, we have to come together as a yoga community, a yoga therapy community to create and hold up spaces that are authentic and then simultaneously create educational opportunities so that we can uplift those communities that are not sure what to do. A lot of people are choosing to be performative because they're not really being given the model of doing the self-study. That's what the sutras say anyway. Do the self-study so that you can figure out who you're supposed to be serving and create spaces where people are really valued, seen, and heard. So my answer is that it's challenging. You know, my colleague is right. If you offer a vinyasa, a power flow, a hot yoga, um, those classes are packed. Um, because that's where society is right now. But if we amplify the value of lifestyle changes, if we amplify the value of social justice, making sure people want to show up however they are, regardless of body size, regardless of color, race, gender preferences, if we truly do that and come across the yoga mat and not be judgmental of our fellow beings in this world, then people will look and seek out spaces that are inclusive that really will allow us to impact capitalism capitalism because if we support these spaces and these values then people will put their money where their mouth is and basically show up and support these spaces and people won't have to only go to places where the western mindset is the primary choice finally i'll leave with this point 
If people want to come to vinyasa, that's awesome. That's where I started. I came in as a hot yogi. I was an engineer running 10 miles a day, doing kickboxing. And I thought, who has time to be peaceful? I just want to raise, you know, my heartbeat. But guess what? Yoga works. And if we believe that and we even promote vinyasa classes, people like me will show up and our lives will be transformed because that's what happened. I found peace on my yoga mat, peace that I had never experienced anywhere else. And that led me to create my yoga space, whether virtual or in person, people's lives are being transformed. And that's really the goal and purpose of yoga. So the answer is yes, but we have to look at where we're coming from. It's a place of healing. That's what we're looking for. That was very beautifully stated, Marsha. Thank you for this deeply inspiring speech. It really gave me a bit of zhuzh here. Um, and it made me think of how change begins. We often talk about change beginning from the people themselves or change becoming starting from the organizations or from the top down. And from what I'm hearing and what you're suggesting is that yoga can be a place where all parties involved can be a part of that change. And the question of course, that we'll ask next would be how. Um, but in the meantime, while we're still marinating on these concepts, Tracy, I'm really curious about your perspective, especially as an academic and for my student perspective as well. Well, this question is perhaps the toughest question for me because I am employed at a institution that is completely steeped in you know, American capitalism and I get a salary and health benefits. And um, so Giri's point about can you change the system from within is my question, right? Um, I am not, even though I have power as a tenured professor, that power comes from neoliberal, you know, academics, you know, and higher education. And um, I'm constantly confronted with the reality that I work for an institution that has a particular mission for social justice, yet in the end makes decisions based on the bottom line. Um, and it's this constant question about whether you can change the, the system from within because I could not live in Los Angeles without my job. I could not have my family um, go to school and eat and have health care without the job that I have. And so um, you really hit me precisely where it hurts because um, what does even any kind of educational context or practical context look like when you're standing from within and you have such critiques of that system and yet your livelihood depends on that system. And so I, what I would say is that I um, go through periods where I agree with Giri that you can't change the system from within, but it, something that, um, keeps me getting out of bed in the morning is my is the students and the people you know precisely who we're meeting with every day who come to you also entrenched in the system and they know something is wrong with their bodies with their selves with society and they're looking for something and maybe they come into your class not knowing what that is you know maybe maybe they do want to lose weight or get stronger or, you know, they have intentions that we might um, say, oh, well, the, that's not the, you know, the, the appropriate intention or someone, sometimes students will come to me um, and they'll say, well, I really want to get X, Y, or Z job, or I really want to do this particular thing. And I'm mentoring a student of color and I'm I supposed to say, no, don't, you don't have a right to that job. You don't have a right to to access in the society, or do I try to work with them to stake their own claim in this world and try to change it with, from within? And so I would simply say that as much as I think the system needs to change, we are a part of it, whether we like it or not. And as much as we would try to tear it down and build it back up, there's a, a certain extent to which we have to acknowledge that the wider forces around us are those forces of neoliberal free market capitalism, um, 
And so we have to find ways of making those small changes one step at a time and resisting where we can and um, meeting every person that we can with love and where they're at, wherever they're at and try to change, change together. Thank you, Tracy. Um, there's a lot of similarities between what you're saying and what Marsha was just speaking to in terms of like meeting the student or the, the client or the yoga practitioner walking in, whether it's, you know, your studio classroom or your academic institution classroom. And I think that gives me a lot of hope that many of us as individuals, as leaders are thinking about these things, not, you know, yes, it's important to think about the grander vision, but we're also really trying to meet people where they're at and uh, facilitate change and transformation and healing um, for individuals, like seeing people as actual people. And I think that's beautiful. Um, I would love to hear from Sham, like the philosophical lens um, on how social justice and capitalism coexist in the modern space um, that we all have, you know, we're degrees in and, and businesses and, you know, actual individual people, um, you know, can they coexist? I'll pass Great. it to you. Thank you. So uh, capitalism, it's an economic system where, uh, two groups, right? One group can invest and the other is a wage uh, laborer. So they, they don't own the means of production, they just get paid for their time. Yoga, uh, as devotion to uh, Ishra, sovereignty, is about you working on uh, overcoming your own challenges, tapas, while owning your own choices, swadhyaya. So you own the means of production as you, pr as you practice yoga. So yoga is this non-capitalist activity. So, um, and so I think if you think that oppression has something to do with capitalism, it's not the, I, I'm not someone who thinks that capitalism is to blame for every problem, but it's certainly to blame for some, right? So uh, insofar as yoga doesn't participate in that, it's certainly a source of, um, uh, of an alternative way of organizing yourself. And, you know, you don't have to go out and murder capitalists. You just do something different, right? You're just not going to do that as a, as a yoga. So in that respect, sure, it coexists, but it coexists because it's just an alternative that doesn't need capitalism to make sense of itself. I think one of the big sources of confusion and problem, and I see this, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna to have to disagree with a lot of folks who have spoken today and here too, is distress on community. So the concept of community is foreign to the yoga philosophy tradition. The main concept is kaivalya, isolation. And if you look at the arguments for yoga, from the very ancient times, it's always been about you as someone not influenced by external factors. So being completely responsible for yourself. So why is that important? That's important, I think, for two reasons. Well, maybe three. One reason is that if we're always expecting community, it's always, it's always about other people setting things up, right? And But the, the change has to come from somewhere. And so if you think about really your responsibility falls to you as an individual to work things out, you become the catalyst for, for social change. Second, healthy relationships are based on healthy people. So if you yourself aren't responsible for yourself, you're not gonna be able, so this, you know, Tracy's comments about her students, I think this is, you know, this, this rung bells in my mind, right? So there were people for whom community was this great thing, all of her white students. And then there were people who were excluded because any concept of community is gonna have a, a, a membership criterion. And as soon as you have that, you're gonna exclude people who aren't part of this. And so the idea of inclusivity while you have community is like fraud um, from day one. And so uh, this brings me to the third funny thing about the idea of community. So where do we get that? Where do we get the philosophical stress on the importance of that? Plato and Aristotle. So you have to go all the way back to the beginning of the Western tradition to understand where these, these arguments for community come from. And so it's no surprise to me that the Western tradition is the global colonizing tradition because it places so much emphasis on community, it had to force everybody else to be part of its community. Otherwise, it wouldn't know how to get along with people. So I see social justice. First of all, I think we just have to kind of be mindful that we're pulling in Western ideas into discussions of yoga when we decide community is going to be the basis. But also to think about how yoga provides us just another way to think of it. Let's just build personal relationships that are 
a reflection of our own health as an individual, right? And let's build those with other people who have an opportunity to practice, make other, give other people the opportunity to practice that too, and then benefit from the, the synergies of healthy people working on each other, right? And so this seems to me to be the way activism works. It's not, it's not by expecting a community to be there. It's about people deciding they're not gonna wait for others to set up a place for them to exist. And then they become the leaders for everyone else. I knew you would have a, uh, a very uh, open, <laughs> um, response to that and I think a challenging response and I'd like to uh, see if either of the other three panelists has a response or you know wants to add anything um, before we move on to our next question. Yeah um, I, I think that we're actually on the same page because if you do your self-study and you really identify who you are and you happen to show up in inclusive spaces where other people have done their work then you're together and that that therein lies the sense of community because everyone is welcomed you know it's not an exclusive community yes i agree that there are thousands of places out there in this world that truly do not invite everyone in but i think the yogic world has the opportunity to be the leader to say no every being is welcomed since i've been teaching online cats show up dogs show up in yoga right because they're like this is cool who is that lady that keeps showing up and making me want my own yoga mat so that i can be a part of it so yes i agree a thousand percent a lot of communities have been exclusive but the community that I think at least that's what I received when I came into yoga. It was a welcoming, inviting place um, that I had to create, by the way, because it didn't exist originally, but I created the space. Um, I was fortunate because my teacher, um, she was a spiritual leader and she's now a minister. And so her thought process is come as you are. And that's what propelled me to be in this place of really working through this capitalism piece. And, and finally, we have the opportunity, I think as a yoga community to have a greater impact on capitalism. And I'm talking about buying properties. Um, there's so many people, I lost the yoga studio during the pandemic, a physical building, but now this is an opportunity for growth to really take advantage of this time to buy property so that people can continue to do the work that's so needed, especially in times when people are impacted physically, intellectually, emotionally, and spiritually. If I may quickly say something too, um, Shiam, I, I really appreciate your critique and it kind of reminds me of the study of, of 911 calls when something wrong was happening, when they did a survey, most people thought that someone else would call the issue into the police. So can we take responsibility to call, to create community for ourselves in our sovereignty, simultaneously creating community so that other people can join it? To me, it seems like a two-part simultaneous process. And Tracy, do you have, would you like to add something? Well, I was just going to say that I would agree that the way in which we deploy the term community today is very influenced by, you know, Western thought. But I also think that if we look at um, Vedic religion and tradition, that the ritual context of Vedic culture, you know, which was originating, you know, developing these terms of yoga was using these terms of yoga in a broader sense of ritual community. And um, so I think this, and it made me reflect on the theme of the conference, diversity and, and unity, and how there is a way of thinking about diversity and unity together and tying that with community that I think is very um, true to yogic traditions, plural, if we're thinking in the ways in which yoga developed in plural ways across time that does see the connection between individuals. Um, and whether you are thinking about it in terms of, you know, an Advaita notion or whether it's a Vishisht Advaita where there is a plurality, uh, you know, along with that, 
um, unity, I think we can think of these things not as opposed, as individual and community as opposed, but together. And yes, we maybe want to resist or embrace certain aspects of Western notions of community, but I wouldn't necessarily say that they are at odds, that, um, that we can think about it made me sorry, it made me think this is going to be a terrible analogy, but it made me think of, you know, uh, the ways in which I've had yoga teachers talk about how well, if the plane is going down, you have to put the mask on yourself first before you put the mask, you know, on your on your child's face. Um, so yes, the plane is going down and we have to attend to ourselves, but that sort of naturally leads us into the other and along with the other. And that we want to be thinking about these as something that's not at odds, even if there are tensions and maybe even contradictions, but we can work through them in, I think, um, a, a rich way. Katie, oh, go ahead. If all community means is social relations, sure, right? But I think that's that was the the the, the philosophical point I was raising. Sure, sure, we can have relationships as individuals. Um, uh, community seems to be something more formal, but that that that. But I agree with everything that you're saying. And Giri, I saw in the chat you uh, wrote. Uh, satsanga and sadhusanga, do you want to extrapolate? Yeah, sure. I think probably in classical yoga, yeah, there's definitely, I don't think there's an influence on, of community in classical yoga. And as you see, there's there's no extant lineage from Patanjali to today. So we don't actually have a classical yoga community descended from Patanjali. But I think in the devotional culture, you have this idea of satsangu, satsanga or sadhusanga, where there's a verse um, in some of the devotional liter literature, sadhu sangha, sadhu sangha, sadhava shashtakaya, lava matra sadhu sangha, sadhava siddhi So this is the idea that through the association of other devotees, all the shashras or the scriptures are revealed. So yeah, perhaps we're getting a lot of community through uh, ideas about community through the kind of the mashup of different yoga, yoga cultures and coming together through, through the history of yoga, being transformed in the Indian subcontinent and exported, you know, to the United States. So maybe perhaps in the classical yoga sutra, you have like a lot of the, the, the concepts of Kaivalya and uh, that, that aloneness of Purusha and Prakriti and also sort of the Pratyahara of like being in an isolated setting, like in your Hatha Yoga scriptures, you're talking about, there's a whole section in, in, in the, in these Hatha Yoga scriptures about building your little mud hut out of cow dung, isolated away from society, you know, so that you can practice yoga alone in the woods, you know, uh, with all of the prana flowing and whatnot. So, yeah, I think um, in a lot of, maybe in the yoga tradition, actually there maybe isn't an influence of, of or, or an idea around community as much as there is in the sort of Hindu community and the, the bhakti and devotional um, cultures that revolve around, you know, coming together, you know, worshiping the deity, having darshana before the deity together, you know, um, sitting with sadhus to learn their knowledge and to get the, you know, transmission of knowledge from them um, um, physically, uh, you know, the mantra is whispered in the ear. So you, you have this, this requirement for community to learn um, all these things in the bhakti tradition. I think many amazing points have been um, brought up and, and we've gone into this realm of community where, um, you know, it, it, Giri just mentioned it, is, is sitting with the uh, sadhu or, or your community of others, right? Because the way, um, you know, this information was transmitted before there was written text um, was orally was by sharing um, not only with a student, but within, you know, Jain, Buddhist, and proto-yoga uh, communities, having conversations where these questions are, are being asked and challenged. So, um, you know, I think every one of you brings up amazing points. And, you know, I think this is where we ask our, our community, our, our chat community, our yoga day community, um, how, 
how social justice and capitalism coexist or if they can, Serenity is going to put up another poll with three questions um, that are tangentially related. How do we, the first question, how do we create systemic or collective change? Um, and there's multiple selections. How, who should be accountable or responsible for leading this change? And then kind of a, an interesting thing that Serenity and I went back and forth on discussing is, can we be a part of yoga without being part of capitalism? So how much money have you spent this year or within the past year on yoga related products? Interesting, right? Um, so we'll look at those answers as you continue to select them. Um, and as we round out this panel, I think, and even looking to the amazing conversation that happened last hour um, on yoga mindfulness and social change panel, uh, where do we go from here? And I think the, the more detailed question is, what is progress from a yogic perspective? Is progress based on outcomes, effort, individual survival, communal collective liberation? Um, and really just where, where do we go from here from each of your individual um, ideas? So Sham, I think you kicked us off with a, a, a budding conversation last round. Let's start with you from the philosopher, academic, uh, entrepreneur perspective. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so uh, with respect to money and business, I think one of the things and I think this is one of the things that uh, you get you you stand to gain by by studying the history of philosophy is that you can you can you can source where some of these criticisms of say financial success or material success come from, and I think they're completely alien to the yoga tradition. Um, it, so if I mean, there's just a lot of passages, even in the Yoga Sutra, where they are about thriving and success and uh, and sutras that have to do with prosperity. Um, as far as capitalism goes, just because you spend money on something doesn't mean uh, you're supporting capitalism, right? It depends what kind of business you are supporting. So, is it a is it a business that's based on the investor, like that's really invested in in that model of uh, capitalist and wage laborer? or not and then you know so especially if you if you spend on small businesses right you're not you're you're going to be avoiding a lot of that because it's often just a single person um and you know uh so that that's not supporting capitalism um now what does social change look like so i think one of the one of the um advantages of thinking about uh, your activity as a yogi in terms of things like Kaivalya as opposed to community, and this goes back to something that Serenity responded to from an early comment, is that you'd stop looking to other people uh, to fix things, right? So like, uh, so in a weird way, being part of a community makes collective responsibility this diffuse thing, right? And then you just look around for everybody else to do their part, and then you feel like, oh, I just have like one little fractional part to do. Right. But if you think about it as like it's you and your life and, you know, you've got to live it in a way that on the other side of the Dharma Mega Samadhi, on the other side of that ethical cleansing, what does that look like? Right. So you have to you have to do the work yourself. And so for me, I often see uh, progress as measured in terms of this of people working on themselves because they become one less problem for everybody else. Um, and then they have this remarkable influence on other people too, that's positive and fecund. So that's that's my response to that question. Thank you. Yeah, to me, you know, yoga is really about taking 100% responsibility for our reality, meaning that we transcend our stories, our ego, and participate in the issues of society and try to change the realities and sufferings of others as well. And that's what I feel like you're speaking to oftentimes. It's that responsibility portion that each of us have something to do with this collective change, not in a small way, but in 100% responsibility that for us to engage with the world itself. Um, Tracy, from a scholarly activist and even from a bhakti perspective, where do we go from here? What are the first steps? 
Well, I would agree with, um, I would agree that we, we, we take responsibility for ourselves and we start with ourselves. Um, I think what I, from a Bhakti perspective, from my own perspective in terms of the intersection of the individual and the social, what I would, I think what I would say, because I've been thinking about this question and I never could quite settle on what I really wanted to say, but my inclination is to say that for me, yoga is about connection and integration that begins with the self. Um, and that it, it, I think someone in, in a comment, I can't remember who said it, said, you know, the microcosm and the macrocosm. So the microcosm leads to the macrocosm. And I think that that's, I would agree with that. And I would also say that progress looks like, um, that the problem isn't us thinking about progress. The problem is when we stop thinking about progress. In other words, that for me, it's sort of an, a never ending process. So yoga is a process of connection and integration. And you begin with yourself and you move outward to the other, you move outward to the divine, and then you move back inward to the divine and the other within. And so as long as we're constantly in process, then I think that's progress, if that makes sense. And the moment that you stop that process is the moment that you've stopped that, that you've lost the progress or you've, you've sort of halted the process. So I think about yoga in terms of connection, integration and process, that constant movement from within to, the, to without and then back to within. So the divine within, the divine without, the divine and the other and then back within. So it's, I don't know that I have a coherent response except to say it's a never ending process. And for me, I always see the problem when people think that they've gotten there or that they've stopped. They've, you know, realized, uh, you know, truth or reality um, when in fact it's a constant process. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, Giti, from a devotee, activist, student perspective, um, what is progress in, in, from a yogic perspective or, or, or yoga industry or perspective? And is it based on individual survival, collectively discussing? What are the outcomes? What, what's the effort that needs to? I think an important subject to bring up here is the idea of neoliberal subjectivity and how neoliberal regimes construct the individual's responsibilities in society where in a neoliberal society, it's not, you know, the United States military's fault for, for you know, polluting the world when they're the, you know, top polluter in the, in the entire globe, but it's your fault. You know, you have to uh, stop using plastic straws. It's not the neoliberal regime's fault. We're, you know, free from blame. So <laughs> neoliberal regimes prevent themselves from being held accountable by sort of enforcing that the individual is responsible for all of the burdens of society. So they become Atlas with the whole globe on their shoulders. And every individual has to better themselves in the neoliberal regime. And then the whole market economy will be better because each individual is making the right choice. It's kind of like Adam Smith's invisible hand of God operating in society, which is actually not the hand of God. It's actually each individual making selfish choices in society that actually benefits the market. So. I think the reason a lot of us are leaning on community is because these are inherently leftist ideas to solving neoliberal problems of constructing an individual's identity as being solely responsible for all of the ills of society. When in reality, we look in crit theory at systemic issues and you know systemic top-down problems and how we can solve those top-down problems. Not everyone needs to pull themselves up through their bootstraps, you know, the children and that are in poverty are, are not responsible for their own poverty. There's actually systemic issues around why these poverty exists and we can solve those systemic issues um, by sort of coming together and looking at material solutions. Um, so I think uh, I may have already answered this question earlier, but I think the yoga studio model needs to change. It's looking at race and gender and intersectionality and these things and sometimes deploying these things quite successfully but there's still not a very good class analysis of the yoga studio model and, and, and how it's constructed in terms of having a hierarchical approach and a capitalist model of, of, of running the business. So perhaps 
um, that can change a bit too. You know, looking at teacher-led co-ops, maybe perhaps perhaps you have a, a different different financial model, a more democrat de democratized, socialized model of of running a yoga studio. Um, to go back to individualism a little bit, though, I think the yoga teacher, the yoga teacher as an individual, also needs to make some changes. Like, I think one great way, one thing that scholars do is they learn language. I'm not saying scholars are, are free of bias or or cultural imperialism, perhaps they're perpetuating in many ways, but I think one way and the first way to interact with an individual of another culture to preventing them from becoming the other is to learn language. So perhaps we need to do a little bit of that. I'm not saying every yoga teacher has to go and study three, four years of Sanskrit, but maybe even just basic Sanskrit, maybe basic Hindi. Maybe we, maybe we learn a little bit about how to interact with these cultures that we're studying and deploying in the West um, through language. So I think that's maybe one very basic way that individualists can change in, in the yoga studio model currently. But I also think there's greater systemic things that need to change in the yoga studio model. Thank you, Katie, for your response. I, as you were speaking, I was recalling Dr. Farah Godridge's work um, that you were mentioning also with neoliberal capitalism, who is actually responsible for this change? And is it up to yoga to transcend the issues or is it yoga to call out to the issues within ourselves as individuals and within the greater systems at large? And then what do we do with that? The big question that keeps coming to my own mind is how? How do we get this change to start? Even if we can point fingers, okay, yes, the system is the problem. I am the problem, but how do we make this happen? And I'm curious to hear, Marsha, from your perspective, being both a practitioner and a business owner, what do you think are the next steps? In our podcast interview previously, you mentioned a few ideas that I would love to hear from you again. Sure, thank you. Um, definitely, <clears throat> it's this opportunity to do uh, collective work. And um, that collective work is based on first, our individual self-study. So that's the first step, is really to hone in on spending time with ourselves individually so that we know ourselves well. Um, the second step is to build relationships, like literally to come together and to sit with people that we may not agree with, people that we may not have grown up with or even you know, gone to the same university with, to really take the time to listen and really build relationships with others. So this is internal, external. And then the other piece is really tapping into a place of resiliency and resiliency is recognizing that there are going to be setbacks, but we have this yogic philosophy to allow us to bounce back in order to continue on this journey because it's so empowering for the individual and the collective. And finally, this sense of compassionate action. Compassionate action is that when we really hold space for ourselves and for those around us. And so I think when we look at that framework in combination with the intersectionality of meeting people where they are, accepting them for who they are and where they are, and then the final piece of just really showing up and coming together to be able to really tear down some of the concepts that are not very positive for all beings. So I'm talking about uplifting our animal friends, the environment, the trees, and looking at making sure that people from all walks of life have access to education, having access to capitalism so that they don't have to be in this power dynamic that has come up a lot. So if we can really empower every being to make sure that they have access to what they need in order to show up in this world, then I think the yogic community can be the leader that we are and really model what it looks like to show the intersectionality of social change and also this ability to use capitalism from a positive perspective. So those are some of my thoughts. I have a lot more, but thank you all for allowing us to show up today to have this great conversation about individual and community, collective and also one-on-one -on -one work. It's all valuable. That's what yoga teaches us, honor all perspectives. And that's how we move forward. It's a continuum of progress. 
That was very beautifully stated. And thank you for closing us out in this wonderful way. Um, I would like to open up the questions for our audience. If you have any questions for our panelists, as Taina mentioned in the chat, please write them um, in the chat for us to call out. But in the meantime, let's reflect on this poll and the responses that we've seen from it. The first question that we have is how do we create systemic and collective change? As we see here, we have about a 50-50, destroy the system, fix the system on the one end, and then transcend the system on the other, just a little bit more than the opposite side. But one thing that I'm seeing in this poll that we all agree with is that we cannot maintain the system. Everything is not great. And we all are very much aware of that. And that's great to know. Second question, I see that who is accountable? Who is responsible for leading the systemic change? I see 82% of us said individuals, which some of our panelists have some rebuttals for, I'm sure, especially with consideration of ne neoliberal capitalism. But it is encouraging to know that if we are individually responsible, that, they're, that we are taking that responsibility, hopefully. Last question, how much money have you spent on yoga related products? That's a big one, calling us all out. I see only 21% of us have spent $0, but the rest of us, we are participating, aren't we? <laughs> uh, we have a question here from Francesca um, or a comment. Uh, to reference another model, the 12-step model does a lot for what's being discussed here in terms of individual and society. So that's another interesting perspective looking at the 12-step model. And if anybody has questions, I encourage you all to raise your hand. Or if you'd like to answer any of the questions that we propose to our panelists, we're also open to that as well. I think RJ Fox uh, brings up a, a really valid and also um, interesting point in that yes we did force the answers to the poll we really i mean this can be a really divisive topic as you see um not that our panelists are you know um i think because of the diverse backgrounds and the emphasis in each and every individual's path and um focus of their career or area of study each one has a unique perspective that i think is valuable to bring to the table and to um, allow us to exchange ideas and really reflect upon maybe things that we haven't thought about. And I think that is first and foremost what Serenity and I came to uh, create the uh, Loyola Marymount uh, Graduate Yoga Studies podcast was to really bring diverse voices in. We didn't want solely academics or solely, um, um, you know, this or that type of person. We wanted a diversity of voices and, and this panel really reflects that. Um, because that is how we learn. That is how we uh, pull down this veil of ignorance. That's how we become discerning practitioners is, is listening and acknowledging and, and creating that knowledge within ourselves, not only of our own, you know, specific path with blinders on, but really listening to others and, and taking that in wholeheartedly. Um, I think we have one other question. Who should lead this change? Force the vote on selecting an isolated element. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, I think it, it, Serenity and I went back and forth about these polls of just like, you know, it, should not the answer be all of the above, right? Um, and I think it's interesting to have to choose who, if we have to make a hierarchy as we most often do in life, right? Um, it's, it's, it's very much, um, should be all of us, but are all of us taking an equal percentage or brunt of the, the effort or the, the blame? And then Giti, one interesting read would be Joseph Alter's book, Gandhi's Body, which talks about the origins of Surya Namaskar God as a, def, a method of empowering the individual in a constitution that guaranteed constitution oh, that guaranteed universal free compulsory basic education, universal and equal suffrage for all literate adults, universal and equal right to work at a minimum living wage. 
yes, I think on Gandhi's birthday as we host today, I think that's a great reminder um, of Gandhi's path, having utilized the teachings of yoga to uh, create social liberation and collective change. And um, I think that's a beautiful way to think about things. I just wanted to comment really quickly on the poll. I really appreciate um, the comment that we were isolating some of the questions. I think the intention of the poll is to spark reflection among all of us. As we're coming to the a close of this panel, I would like to ask, how would you like to participate? What are your next steps to create an equitable society, to create community, to be responsible, and then to make change in this reality? The you know, oftentimes when we're faced with this question, we have to make that first initial step and that decision to make that first step. And we don't know what it is until we actually choose a singular thing. We often want to do all things at the same time, but as individuals, we have to make a choice for our first step. And that's what we're inquiring into. What is it that you want to contribute to into our society as a yoga practitioner? Um, and with that question, I'll lead for Taina for her final remarks. I'd just like to say thank you everyone um, for participating in this panel, Dr. Timeyer, Ranganathan, Marsha, Gidi, Serenity for uh, co-hosting with me and also for the um, showrunners of Yoga Day for uh, inviting us to participate in our season finale of the Graduate Yoga Studies podcast. I think this was a really interesting conversation. I personally even though I've spoken to each and every one of you, it seems like numerous times, um, I always learn something from um, your wisdom and I'm truly grateful to be in community um, as an individual with you all. And I, I really respect the, the diverse um, viewpoints that you bring. And I think that is really the beauty in these conversations is hearing each other respectfully and um, you know respectfully a disagreeing and agreeing and um, learning as a community. Uh, I think that this is a wonderful space and um, I am truly grateful. Yes, as Tracy said, process is progress. Thank you all for joining this podcast panel and I look forward to communicating with you all in the future. What is the podcast that you guys have? Uh, the podcast is called uh, LMU Graduate Yoga Studies Podcast. This is the first season. Um, it's available on the Yoga Studies website. We'll link okay. it right now so that you have access to it. Thank you. Um, we're in the middle of releasing content for the first season, so you can catch right up. And these, these panelists today represent um, uh, some of the interviews that we've done on the podcast this season. Wonderful, thank you so much. No problem.